12 Years in the Saddle for Law and Order on the Frontiers of Texas by Sergeant W. J. L. Sullivan, Texas Ranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 12 Years in the Saddle, Chapters 18 through 27. Chapter 18. Exciting Experiences While Pursuing Bill James I went in 1891, while stationed at Canna, to institute a search for Bill James, who had foully murdered his brother, John, at Bill's home. James was supposed to be hiding in the Comanche Strip, so I took George Black, Frank Hofer, and Billy McCauley, and went to Greer County, where we pinched camp on the north fork of Red River, about three miles from Navajo. We rode every day for five months, and scouted the country all around there. Though our main object was to capture James, we arrested a number of criminals, and put a stop to some of the lawlessness that occurred on the border. We had a number of amusing, as well as exciting, experiences while trying to capture James. I told James' brother-in-law one day that I thought James was in Canna Parker's camp, or in that part of the strip. At that time, Canna Parker's camp was near Fort Sill. The brother-in-law told me that I would be apt to find him there, and I announced that I was going to take all the rangers and go to that part of the strip to look for Bill. I planned and talked about the trip for several days to make everybody think that I was really going to Fort Sill after James. My real intention, however, was to allow James's brother-in-law and other friends plenty of time to get word to him that the officers were to be out of the way on a certain date, and he could come home and see his two-weeks-old babe, which I thought he would do. Then I was to go out a few miles and drop back suddenly at the right moment and capture James. An old man who lived in the community wanted to go along with us to help us about camp and play the fiddle for us and hunt game. He was a privileged character in the community and very amusing as well as useful, so I told him he could go with us. He was elated over the thought of going with us and said he would play his fiddle at night and in the daytime he would kill all the birds on Bitter Creek for us to eat. When the day came for us to leave, a number of men came to see us off. We packed our bedding and provisions in the wagon, and the old man got on with his shotgun and fiddle, and we started off in grand style. We traveled slowly, and lost as much time as we could, in order to be as close to his home as was possible under the circumstances when night came on. At six o'clock in the evening, I told the driver to pull out to the left of the road. It was eight miles from any water, and I remarked that we would have dry camp. The fiddler and birdman asked me what I meant by dry camp. I told him that we were to do without water. He said that he had been thirsty an hour or two, and had been wishing that I would stop and pitch camp so he could get a drink of water. I told the old man that we rangers didn't drink but once a day, and that the mules and horses were trained the same way. He said if he had known all this at first, he wouldn't have come along. We told him that we were a little thirsty ourselves, but if he would play the fiddle for us, it would help us to pass the time away and endure our thirst. The man played and sang for us a little while, and then rolled up in his blankets and was soon asleep, calling hogs and sawing gourds in that good old happy way. After waiting there several hours, I decided we had been away long enough for James to have had time to reach his home, so I woke the man up and told him that we were going back to the river where we could get a drink of that good muddy water. He said that he could not understand our movements, that he thought we were to be gone several days. I told him that we would have to go, and, turning to the driver and the other boys, I said that we would have to travel quietly. We had good luck in fording the river, but when we reached the other side we found two roads, one leading to the left and the other to the right. I had to study a moment to determine what we had better do. I was afraid James had caught on to us, so I sent George Black and Frank Hofer around the left-hand road, and Ferris and I went the other way. I thought, by doing that, we would catch James, even if he became suspicious and left the river to go back to his old hiding place. I told Black and Hofer that if they found the gates down, they must run fast and that we would do the same thing. The two roads were only half a mile apart, and I could hear a dog barking further up the road on the left, and, thinking it might mean that someone had gone ahead to notify James of our coming, we ran as swiftly as our horses could carry us, all four of us reaching James' house at the same time. We quickly dismounted, and the other boys surrounded the house while I knocked at the front door. A lady asked who I was and what I wanted. I told her that I was Sullivan and wanted her husband, Bill. 
She said he wasn't there, and that I had been searching her house so much that she was not going to open the door. I told her I couldn't help that, and, though I was sorry for her, I made her open the door at last. She said she would not turn on a light. I told her I would attend to that part of it all right, and when I went into the house, I pulled a handful of matches from my pocket and lit the whole bunch at once, which made a good light. The boys outside were eagerly watching the house to see if Bill James would run out. I searched the house thoroughly, but could not find my man, and finally decided that he was not there and gave up the hunt. I was greatly disappointed in my failure, for I wanted James awful bad. He sent us a number of messages saying that we had better look out, that he would knock us out of date. If we had met him, though, we would have done what was right by the gentleman. I was satisfied, after we failed to find him, that he was further from home than we thought he was, and that he failed to learn that we had left Greer County. Frank Hofer and I thought once that we had him in a cave. The cave was in the side of a big mountain, and we had to climb about 200 feet to get to it. When we first entered the cave, Frank and I could walk side by side, but the further we went, the narrower the cave got, and we finally had to walk single file. The cave was small, but we soon saw that it opened into another one. It was very dark inside the cave, and we had to feel our way as we went. We came to a place through which we had to go sidewise, and at another place we ran across a spring. We could smell bacon, and knew by that and other signs that men had camped in there, and we were also sure that Bill James was at that moment in the back part of that cave. We came across funny things and heard strange noises, and the further we went, the darker it got. Finally, Frank asked me if I didn't think we were acting foolishly in going blindly into that cave. Well, I expect we are, I replied. Well, let's get out, said Frank. I told him I was willing. So we groped our way out, and we were glad to see daylight again. It was about thirty feet to the top of the mountain, and we knew the cave must have extended quite a number of feet upward. There was lots of brush and wood on top, so we decided to throw down some of it and pile it in the cave and set fire to it and smoke the man out. Frank climbed to the top of the mountain and threw the wood down onto a bench that made off from the mountain, and I dragged it back and piled it up in the cave. When we finished our task, we ignited the wood and brush and got off a little way to wait for the man to come out. The wood blazed up in good fashion, but in a little while we commenced wondering where the smoke was going to. We soon found out, however, for the smoke and heat ascended to the top of the mountain inside the cave, but, not being able to get out, it rebounded and began pouring out of the cave in great volume. The heat was intense, and we could not see which way to turn on account of the smoke. Fire gushed out of the cave, and the flames were blown against us, setting us on fire before we could get out of the way. Instead of smoking out men and fighting criminals, we were setting fire to ourselves and fighting the flames. It would have been better if we had gone on and explored the cave and left the smoking business alone, but we were afraid to venture too far in when it was so dark, and we did not know what we were going to run into. Somebody told us if we had gone on to the end of the cave, we might have found some money, but I hadn't lost any money in there just at that date, and Frank said he hadn't, so we thought we had no particular amount of business in there, and we decided to beat a retreat. James was finally captured in the Indian Territory by some United States Marshals, and was tried for the murder which he was alleged to have committed, but was acquitted. Before I close this story, however, I shall relate another incident which happened while we were trailing James. Early one morning, the other boys and myself went to the top of a mountain to look down upon James's house through a field glass and see if we couldn't catch James slipping into his house. While looking through the glass, I discovered a man about two miles from us and a mile from Bill's house. He was walking around another mountain, and held something in his hand that shined so in the sunlight that we could see it at that great distance. Thinking that was Bill slipping away from house with his Winchester, we ran quickly to the mountain, reaching it in a few minutes. I told Hofer, Black, and Ferris to run around the mountain one way, and I started around the other way. We felt sure we had Bill this time, and were so elated that we ran much faster than was necessary, and were traveling at full speed when we all three reached the man at the same time. We arrested him and asked him his name. He said, I'm Reverend Joe Smith, and as I'm going to preach today, I have come out here to pray. We were dumbfounded. Noticing that the large Bible, which Brother Smith carried, had big silver letters on it, we realized that what we thought was Bill James Winchester was in reality the Holy Bible. Well, Brother Smith showed us the little church, which was situated at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain had obstructed it from our view. 
We humbly apologized to the preacher, and he said that he was thankful and glad to know that it was a mistake. He laughingly remarked that he thought his time had come, and said if he could regain his composure, he would go on up to the church and preach his sermon. Chapter 19 Indians on the Warpath While the ranger boys and I were camping on the north fork of the Red River, still in search of Bill James, we received a call to go about twenty-five miles further up the river to protect a family who were threatened with extermination by a band of Indians. We were quite busy at that time, for every day, nearly, we had a horse thief or some other bad character to capture. We went up, however, to see what we could do for the family who had called for help. I took with me two deputy marshals, Jeff Minette and Tom Mason. I also took my rangers, George Black, Jim Ferris, and Frank Hofer, the latter being the best Indian fighter in the bunch. When we reached the house, where the family lived who were threatened by the Indians, we learned that a young man had killed an Indian who had attempted to steal a steer from them. The Indian was armed with a Winchester, and when the young man caught the Indian in the act of stealing, the Indian tried to shoot him, but the boy was too quick for him and shot the Indian, killing him instantly. The Indians went on the warpath, and sent word to the whites that they would kill everybody on Wolf Creek, and when we arrived upon the scene, we found them in an ugly humor. They had their faces painted up, and had made all necessary preparations to kill out the whole family of the young man who had killed a member of their tribe. We were there to protect the family, and in doing so, it was up to us six men to stand off the Indians, which seemed to us an impossible task. We felt like we were going to be killed, but it was our duty to stay there and protect the women and children from the wrath of the Kohuahua Indians. Those Indians looked quite fierce, and as you may imagine, we looked rather wild too. It didn't feel a bit funny to us, and we certainly felt small when we looked at them. I was not a bit frightened at first, but for three or four days afterward I felt very shaky, and constantly put my hand up to my head to see if I was scalped. We made peace with the Indians by bluffing them, and making them think we would kill all of them if they attempted to fight us. We did not expect to prevent trouble that easily, and were surprised when we learned that they had decided not to fight us. It was remarkable that they were so easily subdued. If they had tried, they would have killed us all, and we often wondered why they didn't. The people, whose lives we saved, were very thankful to us, and when they had recovered sufficiently from their fright, they entertained us royally. We were given all the good fried chickens we could eat, and treated as if we were preachers and lords of England. Chapter 20 The Opening of the Cheyenne and Arapaho Strip In 1891, the Cheyenne and Arapaho Strip was opened up to settlers. Billy McCauley, Lon Lewis, John Harrington, Captain W.J. McDonald, and I left Canna to go to the opening of this strip, knowing that this would be a good place to capture outlaws. We went by Mangum, in Greer County, and got John Byers and John Ovalton, and stopped at Oak Creek, which is about nine miles from what was going to be the new county seat, Cloud Chief. This territory was to open up at twelve o'clock, and when we reached Oak Creek, we got the correct time from one of the soldiers. About 2,500 men were at Oak Creek alone, waiting for 12 o'clock to come. When the hand of my watch reached 12, I laid steel to my horse, and we all made a break for the county seat after crossing Oak Creek, which was about 50 steps from us. Men from all sides of this strip were headed for the new county seat under full speed. Wildcats, lobos, coyotes, antelopes, and badgers were running in every direction. One of our posse roped a deer, and another killed one, while they were all running in every direction. This was about as exciting a time as I ever experienced. Horses falling on every side, from stepping in gopher and salamander holes, and dust so thick that a man could hardly see in front of him. Our crowd made the run of nine miles in thirty-five minutes. I staked out two claims, one within a mile, and the other a mile and a half from the county seat. The signal, which meant that the county seat was open for settlers, was given by a soldier firing a cannon. Up to this time, there wasn't a soul to be seen in the new county. In less than thirty minutes after the signal was given, this was a solid city covered with tents. We people who made the run were to get a business lot and a residence lot. I made a mistake and staked a street instead of a lot. I had quite a little argument before they convinced me that I was mistaken. We failed to locate any parties that we wanted and turned back to our headquarters in Canna. Chapter 21 a cup and saucer event. In the fall of 1892, Captain McDonald discharged the company cook, 
and each ranger had to do the cooking for a week while in camp. On one occasion, it was Ben Owen's week to cook, and after preparing an inviting breakfast one frosty morning at the camp in Amarillo, he discovered in setting the table that he was short one saucer, and it so happened, when the boys took their seats at the table, that Lee Queen was the man short a saucer, and Queen made some remark about everyone having a saucer but him. Owens shoved his saucer over to Queen, striking his cup and knocked a little coffee out on the table, and at the same time remarked, Here, baby, take this one. This seems to offend Queen very much, and he threw the saucer back to Owen, striking his cup, breaking both cup and saucer. Both men jumped to their feet and pulled their guns. I grabbed both men and prevented what might have been a killing over a very small thing. I have always been glad that I was in time to prevent this shooting, and I go on the theory that it is better to be a peacemaker and prevent trouble than to make it. After a few minutes, Owen and Queen saw the folly of their acts, shook hands, and have remained to this day the best of friends. Chapter 22. A Prisoner Escapes While stationed at Amarillo, I went to Woodward, Oklahoma, after a fellow by the name of Bill Hines, who robbed a man of $600 in Collinsworth County. I caught this man, and while we were crossing the Canadian River, about a mile from Canadian City, I dropped off to sleep, as I had been on the go for three days and nights, and was worn out. I woke up in Canadian City, and found that Billy had bidden me goodbye while I was asleep, and had struck a stock train and gone back to Woodward, Oklahoma. He had taken this train before I awoke after our train had arrived in Canadian City. This is the only man who ever made his escape from me. I took the train the next morning for Woodward City, but failed to catch Bill. That day, while I was searching for Bill and Woodward, three prisoners broke jail at this place. I was called on to assist the officers in the capture of these three men. I got in shape at once and joined the posse. Ex-Sheriff Love and I crossed the Canadian River one mile below where the prisoners had crossed. Toby Odom and his posse engaged in a fight with Jim Hefner and John Hill, two of the prisoners. We reached them too late to join in the fight. Both of the fugitives were killed. Ben Woodford's right arm was shot off. George Waddle, the third prisoner, was not with the party at the time of the fight, but we found him one mile from there lying down on his Winchester. He made no fight, and when called upon to surrender, he threw up his hands at once. Several of the men in the crowd said, Let's kill him anyhow. I spoke up and said, If you kill that man, I'll hold you responsible for murder, as he has surrendered and thrown up his hands. Temple Houston, who was with us, spoke up and said, Sullivan, you are right. We sent for a hack and hauled the three men in, two dead and one alive. We jailed Waddle. This fella, John Hill, was a very dangerous man. He feared nothing on earth and was known as a slick artist in the territory in his line of business. Hefner was not so desperate, but all three were bad enough. Chapter 23. The Capture of Rip Pierce I captured one Rip Pierce, charged with holding up a Fort Worth and Denver passenger train, with the intention of robbing the express car. He held up this train in a cut about 400 yards from the Canadian River, near Tascosa, Texas. Rip Pierce was about 30 years of age at that time, and was 6 feet 2 inches and a half tall, and weighed about 200 pounds. When I arrested Pierce, he made no fight. I jailed him at Tascosa. I concealed myself at the jail, and did not let him know it. He became awfully restless, and commenced walking the floor and talking to himself. There were no other prisoners in the jail except him. He cried, and said, If I ever live to get out of this scrape, I will always behave myself and lead a different life. When I made him make that remark, I was satisfied that I had the right man. D. B. Hill was district attorney. I had a hard time locating Mr. Hill, but I kept the wires hot in every direction, and finally got word to him, and he arrived just in time to keep Judge Pennery from releasing Pierce from the jail on a writ of habeas corpus. Pierce had employed Judge Pennery to defend him in his case. Judge Pennery was at one time county judge of his county. Pierce knew that the judge was a fine lawyer, and I also found it out before this trial was over. After Pierce was released, he fell in love with a bunch of horses in Hall County. He fancied these horses, and at last got the consent of his mind to deprive the owner of them, and was captured and sentenced to seven years in the penitentiary. He served his time out, and has been free for several years. I learned that he had reformed and was living a good, honest, upright life, which I was very glad to know. Chapter 24. 
a practical joker, gets into trouble. While I was at Amarillo, one Bob Keen, who was traveling from New Mexico to Amarillo, met the stage coming from Plainview to Amarillo. He held the stage driver up and made him get out of the stage, and pointing his six-shooter at him, he made the driver dance nearly two hours. After releasing him, Keen forced the driver to drink until he was pretty well under the influence of Brother Red Eye. Keen then started on his way, and the driver was satisfied he had gotten rid of him. When he had driven about three miles, however, he heard a noise behind him. He looked around, and Keen threw down on him again, and held him up, and had him to cut the pigeon wing again. The driver reported Keen as soon as he arrived in Amarillo. I was not in camp at that time, and he reported this to the rangers. Bob McClure and one or two of the rangers left at once and followed Keen out to the seven-mile windmill where he had held the driver up. It commenced snowing, and they returned to camp. I came in that night at twelve o'clock off a scout, and they laid this case before me. The next morning I took my saddle horse and one of the state mules and got a buggy, and, with Duncan Meredith, one of the rangers, I started out to find this man. The snow was nearly knee-deep to our team, and covered the ground everywhere in that part of the state, and caused us to lose our way several times. But we succeeded at getting out, and about sixty-five miles west of Amarillo, at Jim Ivey's ranch, I captured Bob Keen. He was tried at Fort Graham for holding the stage up and detaining the United States mail, and was fined nearly a thousand dollars. Chapter 25. Race Thomas is Guarded. I was called by Hughes Tittle, the sheriff of Greer County, to assist him in holding a mob off Jeff Adams and Race Thomas, who had killed McMuse. A mob of 150 armed men tried to take these two men from the sheriff as he went to feed the prisoners. Hughes Tittle was such a noble man, and so well known by this mob for his good qualities and bravery, that the mob would not take his life to get these criminals. Hughes wired me at Amarillo to come and assist him in case the mob made another break. I went at once, and stayed there two months guarding the jail day and night, but the mob never returned. Race turned state's evidence, and Adams got a life sentence in the penitentiary, but was held six years in the Canna jail while the authorities waited to see who had jurisdiction over Greer County, the state of Texas, or the United States, but Uncle Sam finally fell heir to the county. Adams went to the penitentiary for life. While in jail, Adams used every means to make his escape. I was called on by the jailer of Canna to help search the jail when he found where Adams was cutting or sawing. At last we found his saw tied to him on the inside of his clothes. While bringing Adams from Mangum, he and Thomas tried every way possible to pick their shackles when night came on. We had a time getting Adams' shackles and handcuffs off, as he had broken off several toothpicks in the keyholes. We also held Race Thomas for a witness for six years. Uncle Sam agreed that the state of Texas was entitled to jurisdiction over Greer County at that time. I have not given the full details of this trial, as I do not deem it of importance to do so. Greer County is 90 miles long and 78 miles wide. It is the largest county known in the world. At that time, this county was running over with all kinds of outlaws. While in the ranger service, I only searched four caves, one in Greer County, one in the Indian Territory, across the North Fork of Red River, and two in Palo Pinto County. I always felt somewhat lonely while searching these caves. I was one of the rangers who helped to guard George Isaacs at Canna when he was sentenced to the pen for life for killing Tom McGee, the sheriff of Hemphill County at Canadian City. After he was sentenced, I carried him to Fort Worth and jailed him for the contractor at the penitentiary to come and get him. He was pardoned out through a false pardon by a man by the name of Dent, who had served four years in the penitentiary. While in there, he got acquainted with Isaacs. This was during Governor Sayers' administration. Governor Sayers was perfectly innocent of knowing anything of this pardon, or anything of Isaacs being out of the pen, until he was notified by Judge Sam Cowan, a lawyer who helped to prosecute him. The officers who helped hold this court and guard Isaacs during the trial were Fred Dodge, Captain Arrington, one of the old ex-ranger captains, Charlie Stockton, Captain A.J. Payne, three Wells Fargo men, Dick Cofer, the sheriff of Hardeman County, and myself, also several others, 18 guards in all. This is just a small sketch of this. I have not gone into details in this case, as I have in some others. Dent was captured, tried for the killing of Tom McGee, and sentenced to the penitentiary for life, and is now serving his sins. 
Chapter 26. A Sad Farewell. I went to Canadian City one day after two prisoners who were sentenced to the penitentiary. I was called upon to take them to Fort Worth and turn them over to an agent of the penitentiary who was to take them from there to Huntsville, where the state prison is located. Reaching Canadian City, I went first to the hotel to get breakfast. As soon as I set my grip and Winchester down, I was approached by two ladies who asked me if I had come after some prisoners. One of them was an old lady, while the other was rather young-looking, and from the worried expressions on their faces, I took them to be the mother and sister of Jim Long, one of the two prisoners whom I had come after. Long was sentenced to the penitentiary for forging checks on a bank in Canadian City. Answering their question, I told the women that I had come after two prisoners to take them to the penitentiary. Both of them got up from their chairs and commenced to pacing up and down the floor, sighing and groaning. After I had eaten breakfast, the old lady told me that she was Jim Long's mother and that the other lady was his wife. They asked me if they could stay at the jail with Long until the train arrived, and I told them that I thought it would be all right with the sheriff. Getting the sheriff's permission also, they stayed in the jail with the prisoner until nearly train time. When the time came for me to take the prisoners from the jail, I handcuffed them together, and, with the sheriff and the two ladies, we started for the depot. The strain was too great for Long's wife, and she fainted as we were leaving the jail. Long's mother bore up pretty well under the ordeal, though it was quite an effort, but she did it on account of her daughter-in-law, who fainted two more times before we reached the depot. The old lady couldn't keep the tears back, however, and she walked all the way to the depot with her arms around her son. The sheriff and Long's wife walked behind us, the former trying his best to console Mrs. Long. When we reached the depot, Long's mother leaned over and whispered to me that she had 75 cents at the jail, and that she had given her son 25 cents, and wanted to give him the other 50 cents, too. She asked me my advice about it, and I told her to give it to him if she wanted to. She gave the money to him, and when we reached the depot, she told me that she and her daughter had returned tickets to their hometown, but that they owed a four-days hotel bill and had no money to pay it with. They seemed very much distressed about it, but I told them not to worry that I would see that the bill was paid. I found the proprietor of the hotel in the depot and talked with him about the matter, and he agreed to knock off one-third of the bill. I then paid one of the remaining thirds, and the sheriff paid the other, leaving them free of that debt. We saw that they arrived safely home, and it made us happy to think that we had soothed the broken hearts of two poor, unfortunate women. Chapter 27 a clever thief is caught. While at my post of duty in Amarillo, Captain W.J. MacDonald told me to take whichever one of the ranger boys I wanted and go to a certain ranch in the Panhandle country and look after some cattle stealing that was alleged to be going on. I took Jeff Mankins, a ranger who had lately been enlisted in the service. I wanted to try his nerve, and I decided that this would be a good place as this ranch was situated on the Texas and the Territory boundary line and I knew that we would come in contact with many tough characters before we were through with our work in that part of the state. This cattle company boarded Matkins and me and our two horses, and gave us $40 apiece every month above what the state was giving us. At that time I was corporal and drew $35 a month regularly. Matkins and I rode every day for four months looking for cattle thieves. The superintendent of this ranch and his wife and son, all three, claimed that the nesters were stealing the cattle, so we took particular pains to visit these nesters as often as we could, but failed to find any beef on their tables, or beef bones lying around the place. All the beef that we got to eat would be at the general roundups. At these roundups, one of the nesters would kill a calf today, and in a day or two, another nester would kill one of his calves. Then the superintendent of the ranch would kill a beef. This superintendent was paying a high tax to the state for so many head of cattle. This English company seemed to have gotten uneasy, for some reason, and sent from Austin, Texas, a man to investigate the condition of their ranch. He and I had a talk. I had at that time been there only two months. I had ridden this pasture out thoroughly everywhere, and had made close an investigation, and I was prepared to answer this man's questions, and he interrogated me rather closely, too. He asked me how many cattle there were on the ranch that belonged to the company. I told him that I had ridden the pasture for two months, and I didn't believe that there could be over 1,500 or 2,000 head of cattle rounded up in that company's brand. What I said somewhat vexed this man, and he claimed that the company was paying taxes on 18 or 20,000 head of cattle. 
I told him the cattle were not on the ranch. He then asked me what I thought about the stealing that was going on. I told him that I thought there was very little stealing going on by the nesters, though sometimes they might slip a calf, but it was seldom. Then he asked me about the lobo wolves, and I told him that I did not think they were bad, for I seldom ever saw a cow running across the prairie from one high peak to another bawling for her calf and that I believed I could safely say to him that there was a mistake in regard to the nesters stealing the company out, but, if I stayed there long enough, I would catch the parties who were doing the stealing. So I remained there two months longer, riding every day. The superintendent was furnished by the company all the horses that he and his wife and son needed a ride, and all the milk cows they wanted. Outside of that, however, they were not allowed to own a horse or a cow on the inside of that pasture. I began to suspect the superintendent, and one day, during a roundup, while I was sitting under a mesquite tree, the horse wrangler, who had charge of the remouther, came up and talked with his superintendent for quite a while. It came to my mind, when this fellow rode up, that he might be able to give me some information as to whether the superintendent was acting fairly with the company or not. So I took my day book out of my pocket, and I told him that the old man and the old lady had promised time after time to give me the brands of their cattle which they owned themselves. This was not so, however, for the superintendent and his wife never had told me that they owned a cow or a calf inside of this pasture. They told me that all the cows that they needed to milk were furnished to them by the company, and the company would not allow them to own a cow and calf inside of the pasture. This remouther wrangler dismounted, and took my day book and wrote down a brand for the old man, a brand for his son, a brand for his daughter, and two brands that they had bought, making six brands the family owned inside the pasture. I took these brands to the bookkeeper, a nephew of the owner of the ranch, who just had sense enough outside of bookkeeping to know that he was human. I asked him if the superintendent had any right to own brands in that pasture. He said that he was not allowed to own even one cow. I showed him the six brands which I had procured from the horse wrangler, and asked him if he knew whether that superintendent was running those brands in his pasture. He said he did not know it and did not think it could be possible. He asked me to give him the brands, which I did and he sent them at once to England to his uncle. His uncle sent a man at once from England to investigate this matter. The man from England, after investigating the condition of affairs, was thoroughly convinced that the superintendent and his family had stolen this ranch nearly out of cattle, so he fired the whole business of the ranch at once and put another man in his place. The new manager rounded the pasture up from one end to the other and cut the company's cattle out to themselves and counted them he got the large sum of eleven hundred and twenty head. Madkins and I were invited one night by the former superintendent's wife to come up to her house. We accepted her invitation, and when we stepped into her room we hardly knew her. She was dressed in such fine style. Diamonds in her ears, diamonds on her fingers, and diamonds on log chain bracelets, and a three hundred dollar scarf pin. She and Madkins and I seated ourselves around a beautiful table while her husband lay on a fine sofa. Opening the conversation, the lady said, Mr. Sullivan, what I wanted to see you about is in regard to seven men on the inside of these wires. This stealing that is going on will never cease until the scalps of these seven men are taken. She then named the men over to us and said that there was $2,000 apiece for the scalps of these seven men. She said she had the money ready to pay for their scalps as soon as they were turned over to her. I sat still and said nothing, but listened to her proposition. When she had finished, I looked at her and asked, Did you aim that proposition at me? Well, not particularly at you, Mr. Sullivan, she replied, but at anyone who sees fit to take it up. The money is ready now. I told her that the state of Texas didn't have me employed to take men's life and property, but to protect them, and that I was going to execute the law in the proper way. If you or your husband, who is lying over there on the sofa, or your son should violate the laws of our state, I would arrest you as quickly as I would any other criminals. And she saw that I was mad, and she said that she didn't mean her proposition to me, but for anyone who wanted to take it up. When we left the house, I told Madkins that I was a little too hasty in refusing to consider her proposition. A character like that, I said, ought to be in the penitentiary, and as district court is in session, I shall lay the case before the judge and prosecuting attorney. I went to town the next morning and saw those two officials and repeated the whole conversation which took place between the woman and me the night before. I told them that I was going back and take up her proposition and make her pay me half the money down and take her note for the balance to be paid when the work was done. 
Then I will turn the money over to you, Judge, I continued, and we will prosecute that woman and put her in the penitentiary where all such characters belong. The judge and the attorney both spoke up then, and said that I had made her mad, and that I couldn't stand in with her any more. I told them that I could tell the woman that I refused to consider her proposition, because she made it to me in the presence of the other ranger, whom I could not trust, since he was a new man in the company, and I did not know him well enough. I told them again that I could make a trade with her, and we would get the papers and money for proof, and send her to the penitentiary. Both of them begged me not to interfere with her, saying that she was crazy, or she would not have made that proposal to me. They finally persuaded me not to get the woman into trouble, and I let the case stop where it was. It seemed, however, that she was bent on getting into the penitentiary before she was through. A certain man, one of the seven whom she wanted killed, lived in the pasture about a mile from her house. He had been in a shooting scrape with her son a year before and one evening, while sitting in front of my boarding house talking to two other boarders, I saw this man riding from the post office to his home. The woman lived about a block from where we were, and the man had to pass her house on the way home. The woman had often told me that this man was always armed. So on this occasion, as he rode by on his horse, I watched closely to see if I could see the print of his six-shooter. He had on a little blue jumper coat, and I could not see any sign of a gun being on him, though it would easily have made an impression on his little coat if he had been carrying one. As I was watching him ride slowly up the street, I noticed the woman, with the gun in her hand, standing in the east corner of her yard, just a few steps from where the man whom she hated had to pass in another minute. I asked the man who ran the boarding house how long it had been since the man on the horse and the woman's son had met. He replied that they had never met since they had the shooting scrape. I suggested to the men that we watch and see if they speak. As we were on a line with them, we had no difficulty in seeing their movements. Neither one bowed nor spoke to the other. She watched him, but he never looked to the right nor left. He must have seen her before he reached the house, but while he was passing close by her, he never turned his head in her direction, but looked straight in front of him. When he had passed her, she fired her gun twice across the road. He never even looked around to see if she was shooting at him, but rode straight ahead and soon went out of sight. It was nearly dark and we three men were still sitting in the yard when the woman came down to the gate where we were and asked for me. I went to the gate, and she proposed that we walk up the road, saying that she wished to talk with me. After walking about forty steps, she turned to me and asked, Mr. Sullivan, what do you reckon? I told her I didn't know. She then referred to the man whom I had seen on horseback, and said, I was standing in the east corner of my yard a while ago, and that dirty villain passed by and jerked out a rubber-handled, blue-barrel six-shooter and threw it cocked in my face. I asked her why she didn't scream or notify me so I could arrest the man and get his gun. The reason why I didn't, she replied, was that I thought it best for you and me to get in my buggy and go to town in the morning, and I will swear out three complaints against him, one for assaulting me with a six-shooter, one for carrying a six-shooter, and I will also have him put under a peace bond. After telling her I would see her the next morning, I joined the two men whom I left a few minutes before and told them what the woman had said. They said that they had watched every movement that she and the man made when the man passed her house, and that they could swear that the woman's statements were opposite to the truth. I then announced my intention of going to town with the woman and letting her swear out the complaints against the man. I explained that such a character should be in the penitentiary and that it was fortunate that there was a way of getting her in there. The two men, however, begged me not to do that, saying that they did not want to see the woman get into trouble. I laid the case before a merchant, who, I afterward learned, sold lots of goods to this woman, and he begged me not to let the woman perjure herself. I finally decided, myself, that it was not best to let the woman get into so much trouble, but I went to her house the next morning, as I had promised, and asked her if she was ready to go to town. She said she was ready to go right away and swear out the complaints. I then told her that two other men besides myself had watched every movement that she and the man made when he passed her house, and that we were ready to swear that her charges were false as soon as she swore to them. Mr. Sullivan, she replied, let's drop the matter where it is, and let it go, and say no more about it. I told her that that was the safest way for her to do, that the penitentiary would have gotten her if she had sworn out those charges against that man. End of chapters 18 through 27「Twelve Years in the Saddle for Law and Order on the Frontiers of Texas» by Sergeant 
W.J.L. Sullivan, Texas Ranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Twelve Years in the Saddle, Chapters 28 through 31. Chapter 28 The Gordon Train Robbery. While at my headquarters, I received a message from Adjutant General Mabry at Austin, notifying me that a train was held up on the T&P Railroad, four miles east of Gordon, by four train robbers. Superintendent J.V. Good, of that railroad, gave me transportation for eight men and eight horses and saddles, and I left at once for Gordon, taking with me Bob McClure, Jim Wise, Lee Queen, Billy McCauley, Jack Harwell, Arthur Jones, and Vernon Resser, all rangers. We arrived in Gordon that night and put up at the hotel. The next morning, the proprietor of the hotel told me that there was a Jake Smith who lived in the country who looked rather suspicious to him. He said that when the train robbery was announced in the hotel, he noticed Jake Smith turning pale and becoming rather nervous. Jake made the remark, continued the hotel man, that he bet the robbers had gone north. I asked the proprietor if Jake ever came to town much, or was it rather unusual for him to be in town and stopping at the hotel. He replied that Jake hadn't been in Gordon before in two years. We started out early the next morning to the country to look for the robbers. On account of what the hotel man had told me, I went to Jake Smith's house, but before reaching there I procured some more information concerning Smith. I learned, among other things, that two suspicious characters had been staying around Smith's place and that one of them was wounded and remained there about six weeks. The sick man went by the name of Wilson and it was presumed that he was shot while robbing some train or store. I was pretty well prepared for Jake when I first reached his house, but I didn't let him know it. I shook hands with Jake and told him that I knew very little about the country, and that I wanted him to pilot me to a place called Board Tree Springs. He said he would take me there, and we tramped all day through the rocks and brush, and walked and rode around the many crooks and turns of the Brazos River, not reaching Board Tree Springs until late that evening. He could have taken us there in a half hour if he had wished to do so, as it was only a mile and a half from his house. But Jake did not want to find these springs any sooner than he could help, for he knew that we would discover something there. When we reached the springs, we found four pallets made of sage grass spread upon the ground where four men had slept. The pallets were about twenty feet apart, and we saw that they had tied four horses up for a long time. We learned afterward that the robbers had concealed themselves at this place, and that they waited there for Wilson the wounded man who stopped with Jake Smith to get well enough to join them and help them rob the T&P train. After Wilson got well, they had to wait then for the train that was to bring the money to pay off the coal miners at Thurber. A little while before the train was due to pass by with its $50,000, the robbers captured the section hands and forced them to spread the rails about nine inches. Then they made the hands walk up the track about a hundred yards away from the spreading of the rails, and when the train arrived, they ordered Lockerbie, the section foreman, to flag it. When the train stopped, the robbers jumped into the express car to take the $50,000 out, but failed to get it as the money was in a Thurber safe, which had a time lock on it. They carried off $2,000, however, that they found in another safe, which was smaller than the Thurber safe and more easily opened. The train pulled into Gordon an hour late, and the conductor reported the robbery to the officers, and, as already stated, I was then ordered by Adjutant General Mabry to do all I could to run down the robbers. Governor James S. Hogg was on the train when it was held up. When we reached Bortree Springs, we found a large bay horse, branded low down on his left thigh with the letter E. This horse was shod with new shoes, but his feet were terribly cut and bruised around the hoofs. They had run him over the hills and rocks until he was a unable to travel any longer. The robbers then stole a paint horse and rode him out and left the bay. In a live oak thicket near where the men had done their cooking, I found two boxes, a coffee pot, frying pan, skillet, and a water bucket. Jake Smith claimed that the first day they came to his house there were only two men, and he said they told him that they wanted to find a pasture for twelve or fifteen hundred head of cattle. Jake said that the men borrowed the cooking utensils which we found in the thicket from him. He also explained Wilson's presence in his house, by saying that the latter came to him and claimed to be suffering with a rising, and he felt sorry for him and let him stay in his house. I also found a nail apron with sugar in one end of it and salt in the other. 
A carpenter was working on Smith's house when the two men first took dinner there, and while the wounded man was boarding with Smith. Upon opening the two boxes which I found, I discovered some soda in a lady's dress sleeve, and some new clothes with cost marks still on them. I learned that a store had been robbed about eighteen miles from there, and I notified the merchant of my discovery, and he identified the articles as some of his merchandise and took them back with him. On the two boxes, which we opened, we found written in big letters this warning, Look out for smallpox. All this proved to us that the men were guilty, and that Jake Smith had aided them somewhat in their work, so I told Jake that he was under arrest, but I kept him in the mountains eleven days before I took him to jail. After arresting Smith, I went on that evening to Jack Scott's house to arrest him, too. When we arrived at his house, Mrs. Scott informed us that her husband was down at Bill Hitson's, near the river, helping to brand cattle. Our party at that time consisted of eighteen men, and I did not want to take so many to Mr. Hitson's, so I asked Mrs. Scott if she could keep nine men for me that night, and she replied that she could. I left them there, and the other eight men and myself started for Bill Hitson's place. When we were halfway there, we met three cowboys, and I spoke to them and asked if one of them was Jack Scott. One man spoke up and said he was Scott, so I put him under arrest and took him back to Bill Hitson's with me and let the other two cowboys go. The nine men whom I had left at Mrs. Scott's came up and told me that the two cowboys, who were with Scott a little while before, had reported to Mrs. Scott that I had arrested her husband, and she ordered them off the place, saying that she did not want them to roost under her roof. Hitson had to take care of all eighteen of us, but he did not seem to mind it, and treated us nicely. I didn't let Smith and Scott get together, for I did not want them to make medicine. I went back to Scott's house the next morning with him, and offered him five hundred dollars if he would tell me the names of the guilty parties, but Scott replied that he did not know any more than I did about the affair. I got him to walk with me back to the bunch of men where Smith was. When we got close enough for Smith to hear me, I said to Scott, I thank you for giving me so much information about the guilty parties. I watched Smith closely to see what effect that would have on him. He turned pale at first, and in another minute perspiration began to pour off his face. I looked around over the boys, and acted as if I was quite particular about whom I selected, and told Bob McClure and Lee Queen to guard Jake carefully, that we surely did not want him to escape. After I had handcuffed Jake, we mounted our horses and rode off, Jake and I riding close to each other. Jake asked me what Jack Scott had told me. I replied that Scott had informed me that he, Jake, had harbored the man who robbed the store and the express car. He said that Scott was a liar. I saw all the time that he was worried, and I tried hard to make him break down and give me the names and whereabouts of the robbers, promising to release him if he did so, but he would not do it. When we reached Smith's house, I left Jake outside with the others and took Jim Wise, a ranger, into the house where Mrs. Smith, her daughter, and three young men were. I asked Mrs. Smith if these three men were her sons. Two of them are, she replied. I want to talk to the oldest one, I said, and she consented. The young man stepped forward, and I informed him that his father was under arrest for being an accessory to the Gordon train robbery. I told him that his father had informed me that he had let the robbers have a bucket, some cooking utensils, some flour, and some meat, but he could not remember whether it was a ham or a shoulder. It was a ham, said the boy. I told him that his father couldn't remember the dates when he did these things, but asked me to see his sons about it, saying they could remember such things better than he could. Well, I remember when the things occurred, replied the boy, but I cannot remember the dates, though I think my brother can give you that information. I called his brother then, but he couldn't remember the dates either. He, however, also said what I wanted him to. Like his brother, he did not suspect my purpose, and told me that he knew these things happened, but could not remember the dates. Mr. Smith's family seemed to be very nice people. Mrs. Smith sat still during my conversation with her son, and when I was through with him, I told her that everything pointed to her husband's guilt. She made no reply, but I could tell what she and her children were thinking from the significant expression on their faces. Their countenance seemed to say in words, Father... Husband, you should not have stood in with Bill, the crippled robber, and if you hadn't, you would not be in such a bad shape now. Captain Lightfoot, an officer from Thurber, and I took Smith to Dallas and lodged him in the county jail. When he entered the jail, he turned over all the money he had with him, except two dollars, to the jailer. Because he broke into the Dallas county jail with the small sum of two dollars, the jail birds flogged Smith soundly, and, stripping him, poured a pitcher of ice water on him. Smith was tried for his part in the robbery, but was acquitted, though the common belief was that he was guilty. 
McCall, a prominent attorney of Weatherford, represented him. After disposing of Smith, I returned to the mountains to capture the four robbers. One night, while some of us rangers were in a mesquite flat, we looked up and saw four men coming down off a mountain. I told my boys that they must be the robbers, and when the men got closer, we heard them say something about us being rangers. Then, believing more firmly than ever that they were the robbers, we charged them, but when we arrived within fifty yards of them, a man in the crowd called out to me that he was Sheriff Williams of Young County. They were looking for the same robbers that we were, so we joined forces and went to Hitson's Ranch to spend the rest of the night. We were in a mighty rough country to hunt criminals, and were very much handicapped in that respect. We were told, upon good authority, that there were 311 miles of crooks and bands in the Brazos River in Palo Pinto County, while it is only 30 miles straight across. No one can imagine how rough it was up and down that river, unless he has been there long enough to see it for himself. It was hard on us rangers, coming, as we did, off the plains in August, and dropping down into these hills, rocks, cat claws, and prickly pears at such a dreadful time of the year. We learned some time after we first visited Board Tree Springs that there was a cave about 75 yards from there which led under a hill. We thought it possible for the robbers to be in that cave, so we entered it and searched thoroughly for the men, but failed to find them. It was such a gloomy-looking place in there that we drew straws to see who were to go in, and it fell on Arthur Jones and me. The cave was about seven feet high and eight feet wide, and extended back about a hundred yards. Arthur and I searched every crook and corner, and discovered many rocks, some of them weighing from sixty to a hundred tons. With our six-shooters cocked and ready for action, we looked behind every large rock, and were disappointed every time we failed to find the robbers. While we were going out of the cave, we heard the sound of money, and heard the boys outside calling out to us that they had found money. Arthur and I both broke for the entrance, and before we got out, we heard one of the boys say, It's a twenty-dollar bill. Our lights went out, but we did not stop running. We ran into so many rocks, however, that we were skinned up and bruised from head to foot, and looked as if we had been in an Irish battle. When we reached the outside, the boys gave us the horse laugh, and we were confronted with the cold fact that it was all a joke. We stayed in that country for some time after that, but were finally forced to abandon our chase, as luck was entirely against us. Chapter 29 The Surrender of Four Train Robbers On the night of November 14, 1895, being at headquarters camp in Amarillo, on the Fort Worth and Denver Railroad, I received a telegram from George Leftrick notifying me that six well-armed men, whose actions were suspicious, were camped in Sid Webb's pasture, twelve miles south of Bellevue, Clay County, Texas. I had just returned with seven mounted men from an unsuccessful search, lasting eighteen days, on the Brazos River and in the Palo Pinto Mountains, for four men who had held up a Texas and Pacific train, four miles east of Gordon, in Palo Pinto County. Knowing that a train robbery had been committed at Red Fork some time previously, and suspecting that these men mentioned by Leftrick were the robbers, I took Billy McCauley, Jim Wise, Doc Neely, Jack Howell, and Bob McClure, and left for Bellevue, shipping our saddles on the train. On arriving within two and one-half miles of Bellevue, I got George Thorne, the conductor, to stop the train, and four of us got off, taking our saddles. Concealing ourselves, we sent word to Leftrick by the other men, informing him of our location, and requesting him to come and bring horses for the party. When Leftrick arrived, I asked him to guide us to the house where the six men were. When we had gotten within two and one-half miles of the house, I saw a man on horseback some distance off, and he discovered us about the same time, and raised his head and watched us. We were riding fast, and I told the boys to slow their horses and I would investigate the man. When I started toward him, he broke, and when he did so, I motioned to the boys to come on. I soon came to a four-barbed wire fence, which I cut, letting the boys through, who came up just as I finished cutting the wires. I mounted my horse again, and we captured the man after chasing him a mile and a half. He was also wanted, so I arrested and handcuffed him, and took him with us to within 250 yards of the house where the six men were encamped. When Leftrick showed me the house, I turned the prisoner over to Doc Naley, one of the rangers, with instructions to hold him there, and, telling the others goodbye, I ran my horse to the house, my men all following. When I reached the house, I got off my horse, leaving the reins over his head. I took hold of the doorknob, and as I did so, the men in the house held the knob on the inside and fired two shots through the door, the bullets passing between my legs. I stepped back about four or five feet from the door and ordered the boys to fire through the door, and we emptied our Winchesters and six-shooters. 
Billy McCauley and Jim Wise were in front of the house with me, and Bob McClure and Jack Harville and Leftrick were at the back of the house behind the dugout. As I knew the balls we were firing through the door would go entirely through the house, I told Billy McCauley to go behind the house and tell the other three men to come to the front, as they were not needed back there, there being no windows or doors in the back of the house. After we had emptied our Winchesters and six-shooters, McCauley and Wise stepped behind a rock chimney to reload, and I walked backward to an old wagon that stood about twelve steps from and in front of the door of the house. I reloaded my Winchester and six-shooter, watching the house all the time. By this time, the men on the inside had gone up into a loft in the house, and we afterward learned that while they were downstairs, we shot the hat off one of the men's heads, and a bullet grazed the neck of one of the men, cutting his coat collar and shirt. When they reached the loft, they began fighting us from there. After I had reloaded, I motioned to Billy McCauley and Jim Wise to come to me. Jim didn't come, but Billy joined me and asked me what I intended to do, and we were then about six feet from the door. I'm going to break the door down and go in, I said. Isn't that very dangerous? asked Billy. Yes, I replied, but it is just as dangerous here. We have to get them, and that is the only way. I then broke the door open and sprang into the house, Billy following me. I saw that the floor of the loft was made of plank an inch thick, with no opening except where a ladder led from the bottom floor to the loft. After Billy and I had gotten inside the house, and after I realized our dangerous situation, I told him to go outside or he would likely be killed, for he was a brave young man who I knew would not desert me. I tried to persuade him to leave the house, for I realized that if he was killed, I would be partly responsible for it, having asked him to come in the house with me, but he refused to go and said he was in there to stay, and if I had died, he would die also. Just before we entered the house, I placed my left foot on the bottom round of the ladder leading into the loft, threw a cartridge into my Winchester, and shouted to the man above me that I was in there with him. They asked who I was, and I told them my name, stated that we were Texas Rangers, and I wanted them to surrender. Their leader, who went by the name of Skeeter, then said to me that they would never surrender. I told him I had the house surrounded by my men, and there was no chance of escape, but if they didn't come out and surrender, I would set fire to the house and fire them out like rats, while if they surrendered, they would not be hurt. One of the men then told me he would give up, and Skeeter said to him, If you surrender, I'll kill you. If that man wants to surrender, I said, and you kill him, I will burn you at the stake. Of course, this was a bluff, as far as the burning part was concerned, but I was determined if this man wanted to surrender, he should not be hurt. I am coming, said the man who offered to surrender. Be quiet while I talk to you, I replied. Let me see your hands up to your elbows before I see your body, or you are a dead man. Don't attempt to deceive me and try to take advantage of me, for I have the advantage of you. I have a cartridge in my Winchester, my finger on the trigger, and my hammer gone after fire. Here I come, he said. Let me see your hands up to your elbows first, I replied. He did so, and I arrested him, and also arrested the other men in the same manner, and turned them over, one by one, to Billy McCauley as I arrested them. When I had finished, we went outside the house to the spot where I left Doc Neely, about 250 yards away, with the other prisoner. I took the handcuffs off this man, and handcuffed the two strongest men together. My horse, and those of nearly all my men, ran away during the fight. I had a pair of handcuffs and a pair of shackles in my saddle packets. I had one of the rangers go after the horses, and he found them nearly four miles away from where we were, in the corner of a barbed wire fence. When he returned, we hitched the prisoners' horses to a little wagon and took the prisoners to Bellevue, and that night we put them on the train and took them to Wichita Falls. Besides the men, we also captured six Winchesters, four six-shooters, eight belts, 1,000 rounds of cartridges, 25 California blankets, and a new saddle and bridle they had stolen from a man by the name of McDermott. The man who owned the house in which we captured the men asked Cooper Wright, the sheriff of Clay County, if he could not recover damages from the state on account of his house being shot and torn up. But the sheriff advised him to keep quiet, stating that if I heard he was talking of making a complaint against me, I would arrest him for allowing such characters to stay in his house, and he took this advice. The four men whom we captured belonged to Bill Cook's party of six. The other two men, Bill Cook and Jim Turner, at the time of the capture of the four men mentioned above, had left the camp before we arrived, in order to locate a place where they could hold up the Fort Worth and Denver train, and also the Rock Island train, on the 17th day of November, 1895. When I arrested the four men at the camp, Bill Cook and Jim Turner were on the way back to camp, having perfected their plans to hold up the two trains, 
and were within a half mile from the camp at the time of the fight, but upon hearing the shooting they thought it best not to come to the camp. The four men whom we captured were tried at Fort Smith, Arkansas, for the two train robberies and a post office robbery. Charlie Turner turned state's evidence, and his case was dismissed, but the other three men pled guilty, and were sent to Sing Sing for thirty and twenty years each. We got eight hundred and fifty dollars for their capture. Chapter 30. The Pursuit of Bill Cook and Jim Turner. Immediately after the trial of the four robbers, whom we captured in Sid Webb's pasture, I got my men together and started out after Bill Cook and Jim Turner. I went to Jack County, and while searching in that part of the country, I went to the home of a Mr. Snyder. Jim Turner's father was living there at that time, he being Mrs. Snyder's brother. When my man and I reached the house, Mr. Snyder, Mr. Turner, and another man came to the door, and I told them to come to where I was, which they did. I asked them if Bill Cook and Jim Turner were in the house, and they told me there was no male person in the house. I told my men, however, to stay where they were and hold these three men, and I would search the house. When I reached the door, Mrs. Snyder told me to leave my Winchester out of doors, but I told her to please step out of the door, and she did so. I entered the house, searched one room, but found no one. When I entered the room where Mrs. Snyder was, I noticed a large object under the corner of a bed in that room, and there was a small part of the brim of a hat visible from under the edge of the cover. I had my Winchester in my right hand, and with my left I jerked the cover back. As I did so, the fellow swore he would fight every one of us, and use profane language to give weight to his words. When he made this remark, I cocked my Winchester and placed the end of it in his mouth. My men heard this man when he spoke, and heard the rattle of my Winchester, so they rushed in. Mrs. Snyder was wiping out a heavy tin biscuit pan, and when she saw my boys coming in, and saw the dangerous position of the man in the bed, she hit me over the head as hard as she could with this pan, and said to me, You came near killing my son. When I collected my wits and got my hat back on my head, I told my men to go to my horse and get my handcuffs and shackles, and that I would handcuff this man and shackle the old lady and take them to Jacksboro. She told me if I would not arrest her, she would sit down and behave herself, and I told her if she would do so, it would be all right. The three men then came to the door, and Mr. Turner fell and asked Mrs. Snyder for the camphor, saying he had palpitation of the heart. And I said to him, You old villain, you told me such a lie, I have a good notion to give you palpitation of the head. He then said that the man in the bed was Mrs. Snyder's son, but that he had forgotten about him being in the house, that he had been to Bowie, gotten drunk, and then thought my man and I were officers from Bowie who had come to arrest him. I then released this man and left, having seen nothing of Cook and Turner. On December 22, 1896, I received a letter from J. H. Harkey, sheriff of Dickens County, stating that there were two suspicious characters in his town, Dickens, and from the descriptions he gave, I was confident that they were the two men I wanted. My man and I went to Childress, shipping our horses, and then rode from there across the country to Dickens, 125 miles away. When we arrived at Dickens, Sheriff Jeff Harkey again described the two men to me, and I was still more confident that they were the two men I was after. The sheriff said they had left Dickens and had gone to Scurry County. He consented to go to Scurry County with us, which was 125 miles from Dickens. After we arrived in Scurry County, we went to Mitchell's Ranch, the square and compass by name, which was about 50 miles southwest of Snyder, Scurry County. Here we received information from John and Jim Mitchell in regard to Bill Cook, alias Mayfield, and Jim Turner, and they told us the two men had been at their ranch, but that they had gone to Green Eyegold's ranch, 100 miles from there. I had sent back all but two of my men at Dickens, keeping Billy McCauley and Vernon Resser. Deputy Sheriff Ira Gooch joined me at Snyder, Scurry County. Norman Rogers, the sheriff of Kent County, also joined me. Sheriff Harkey left me eight miles from Gale, Borden County, his horse being sick. When I started to Green Eyegold's ranch, I had with me only three men, Sheriff Rogers, Deputy Ira Cooch, and Vernon Resser, Billy McCauley being forced to stop at Pete Scroggins' ranch, his horse having given out. When we reached Eyegold's ranch, we hitched our horses and started to the house, where we saw Eyegold standing in the door and five men standing at the window. I told my men to keep an eye on the parties at the window while I had a talk with Igold. When I started toward Igold, he said that I must leave my Winchester out of doors. I told him to get out of the door, which he did, and I entered the house. 
I asked him if those were his men standing at the window, and he replied that they were. I then asked him if Jim Dillard was there, and he said he was. I told Dillard to step out of the crowd, which he did, and I arrested him as he was wanted at Colorado City for shooting up the town. He and Joe Elkins and Jim Turner had been arrested by a deputy sheriff at Colorado City, but they had escaped. I learned from my gold and his men that Cook and Turner had been there, but had left several days before. I took Jim Dillard and started back to Pete Scroggins Ranch, where we were to spend the night. On the way there, I met Joe Elkins, who was with some cowboys driving a bunch of cattle. I arrested him also and took him with me to Scroggins. The next morning, I told these two men if they would tell me where Bill Cook and Jim Turner went when they left Igold's ranch and their plans, that I would release them. They accepted this proposition and told me that Cook went to Roswell, New Mexico, and Turner went to Colorado City to meet his sweetheart, Zeddy Sweezer, where they were to be married that Bill Cook's sweetheart and his sister were to join him at Roswell, and that Turner was captured in Colorado City, but made his escape. The young lady afterward located him, and they were married in Big Springs and went to Roswell. They lived there three months when Turner was arrested and jailed at Fort Smith, Arkansas. When I was at Mitchell's Ranch, as stated, I learned that there was a letter in the post office at Grassland, Texas, in care of the Square and Compass Ranch for Jim Turner. My men and I were almost broken down, so I got John Mitchell to get the letter for me, of which the following is a copy. Roswell, N.M., December 25, 1894. Mr. James Turner, Grasslands, Lynn County, Texas. Sir, we received your letter yesterday that you wrote to Santee. You wanted to know where he is. He left here last May and started to the Indian Territory. We have some kinfolks there. We have never heard of him yet. I will close. Mama said she would write to you, but she is getting very old and cannot see. Hope you all have good luck. It seems like I know you. I have heard Santy speak of you so much. Yours respectfully, Della Harris, Roswell, Chaves County, New Mexico. When I captured Bill Cook's four men, as I have already related, I found on one of them a list of 14 men who had participated in four robberies with Bill Cook. One of the names on the list was Santy Harris. By getting the above letter, I obtained a clue as to Harris's whereabouts, and it also led me to believe that if Bill Cook was in Roswell, as I had been informed, he would likely be at the Harris home, or, if not there, they could doubtless tell me where he was. My men and horse were completely worn out, so I took them to Colorado City and sent them by rail to headquarters at Amarillo. I then went to Roswell, but to keep from attracting attention, I went alone to the courthouse, where I spent the day having my dinner brought to me so I would not be seen during the day. When night came on, I asked the sheriff if he knew a family in Roswell by the name of Harris, and he answered that he did. About eight o'clock that night, I asked him to show me their house. He went with me until we were about seventy yards from the house. Then he stopped and pointed it out to me, but would go no further. After telling him to wait for me at the courthouse, I entered the gate at the Harris home, and was about to close it when a man came up, and I asked him if Mrs. Harris lived there, he replying that she did, as she was an aunt of his. I asked him to tell her I wished to speak to her, and after he had done so, she came to the door and asked me in, but I told her I preferred to talk to her at the gate. She then came to where I was standing, and told me she was Mrs. Harris. I told her my name was Bob Turner, Jim Turner's brother, that Jim had promised to meet me at her house, and a friend of mine by the name of Williams, or probably Mayfield, had also promised to meet me there and if my friend had been to her house, she had likely learned that the names Williams and Mayfield were his aliases, and she'd probably learned his real name. She replied, saying that my brother Jim had not been there, but my friend had been, and that his real name was Bill Cook, that he had arrived there Thursday at noon, and left Friday morning before sunrise. I asked her if he told her to tell me where to meet him, and she said he didn't mention Bob's name, but said to tell brother Jim to meet him at a ranch, the name of which she had forgotten, but it was just to the right of White Oaks. I then told her that some of our party had been captured on the Texas and the Indian Territory line, and also said I had heard her son, Santy, speak of her daughter very often. The man I met at the gate and Mrs. Harris's daughter were in the house, and heard me make the remark about Santy speaking of his sister, and they then came to the door, and the man said, This is Della, now. I then told her about seeing her brother, and Mrs. Harris asked me where I saw Santy. I replied that he joined us last May, and she then denied his ever being out of New Mexico, 
but said he was then about fifty miles from there, with his father herding cattle. The man and the girl standing in the door then spoke up and said, Why, mother, you ought to be ashamed to tell the man that. He is all right. But she told them to keep quiet. I said I would not argue about Santy, but I would like for them to show me the way to White Oaks. I then shook hands with all of them, and asking them not to mention having seen me, I started toward the mountain. After I had gotten out of sight, I turned and went to the courthouse, where I explained to Perry all that I had learned from Mrs. Harris in regard to Bill Cook, and told him to get a buggy and a pair of the best horses he could find, and we would go to White Oaks on the following morning, and capture Cook, White Oaks being 100 miles from Roswell. I told Perry I had been following Cook so long that I was completely worn out, and I had to have some sleep that night before I could go to White Oaks, but that I would be ready to go with him at daylight. The next morning, I learned that Perry had gotten another man and left for White Oaks that night about midnight. If I had been in my own jurisdiction, I would have gone to White Oaks that morning alone, but being outside the state of Texas, I had to have the assistance of some New Mexico officer before I could arrest a man. I therefore asked ex-Sheriff Billy Atkins to go with me to White Oaks, explaining to him the way Perry had treated me, and he said he would be glad to accommodate me, as I had assisted him in Texas several times, but that if he did so it would cause trouble between him and Sheriff Perry. Being unable to get anyone to go with me to White Oaks, I decided to go to El Paso, thinking it probable that Perry would not find Cook, and that he, Cook, would go to El Paso. At Eddy, I learned that a man had been placed in jail there a short time before, so I stopped over, thinking, perhaps, this man was Jim Turner, as I was told he was heavily armed. But on going to the jail, I found he was not Turner, but was a man who I had seen at Thurber, Texas, some time before. The train having left me, I had to stay in Eddy until the next morning, and that night the sheriff and I searched Eddy and another small place a mile from there, thinking we might find Jim Turner, but we failed to do so. The next evening I left for El Paso. Captain J. H. Hughes was camped at Isleta, twenty miles from El Paso, and I wired him to meet me at the train and go to El Paso with me, which he did. We made a thorough search, both in El Paso and across the river, in Old Mexico, but did not find Cook. That night I heard that Cook had been captured at White Oaks by Sheriff Perry, but it was no surprise to me. I boarded the eastbound train and went back to Pecos, where I met the train Cook was on. I found him with Perry, Tom Love, and one McMurray of Colorado City. Perry was standing on the platform of the train, and I went up to him and said, You have treated me worse than any honorable officer would treat another. I also told him that was a dirty game he played on me in Roswell. He did not say a word went into the car where Cook was. I followed him and saw Cook in chains facing me. I spoke to him, calling him by his name, and he said, Howdy, John L. On my asking him how he knew me, he replied he had had me described to him very often. Then he wished to know how I happened to recognize him, and I told him I had had his description a long time, but that I believed I would not have known him if it had not been for the squint in his left eye. Perry and his men had walked back to the rear of the car, and Cook said to me, Those men have gone back there to make medicine against you, for they have all said they intended to beat you out of the reward and honor of my capture, which I think you justly deserve, for you have simply lived on my trail. Is your Winchester a forty-five ninety? he then asked. Yes, I replied. Well, that is my gun, and I suppose you captured it when you captured my four men. I bought four of those guns at the same time, one for myself, one for Brother Jim, one for Cherokee Bill, and one for Jim French, costing me eighteen dollars at the factory. Where were you at the time I captured your four men? I asked. I was about half a mile from you. Jim Turner and I had been out planning to rob the Fort Worth and Denver and the Rock Island trains, and were just returning to camp. Didn't you find a money sack made of ducking, with a train bell cord worked in the top like a tobacco sack? We were going to put the money in that sack when we held up the trains. Yes, I found it, I replied. I have it at my camp. I then said to Cook, Bill, you know you are done for now, and you will never be free again. Tell me where Jim Turner is. Now, Jim left me at the ZL Ranch, he replied, and went to Colorado City to meet his girl, and we were all to get together later on and go to Old Mexico. This girl's name was Zeddy Sweezer. Well, that's all I know about Jim. Why didn't you and Jim help your men when we captured them, if you were only half a mile away? Well, we had left our Winchesters at the camp when we went out to plan for the holdup, so we would not attract attention, and had only our pistols with us, and decided it was best not to come up without anything but our six-shooters. 
If I had had my Winchester, I could easily have killed you eight hundred yards away. We met an old gentleman and two ladies in a wagon. The ladies had fainted, and the old gentleman was fanning them. The man said to us, You men are strangers to me, but don't go where you hear that shooting, for they are having one of the biggest fights I ever saw. They made my horses run away. Jim and I afterwards scouted around in Jack, Palo Pinto, Clay, and Dickon counties, keeping on the move all the time. When the train arrived in El Paso, I stepped in the depot to put my Winchester and overcoat away, and when I came out, I saw that Perry and his men were taking Cook away in a carriage. After they had gone up the street a short distance, they opened the window and looked out. I got a carriage and passed them. They had stopped, and the reporters were writing down every word Cook said. I drove to the Wells Fargo Express office and wired to three friends of mine at Kansas City, Simpson, Stockton, and Ed Dodge, who were in the employ of the Wells Fargo Express Company, stating that I was in El Paso, that Bill Cook had been captured, and explained how the three men had ruled me out of the reward entirely, and that I wished to put in my claim for my part of the reward. I only asked for one-fourth of the reward. In about an hour, I received a telegram stating that they recognized my claim in full. I have never received any part of this reward. Chapter 31 on the 11th of January, 1895, I went to Eddy, New Mexico, in search of Jim Turner, Bill Cook's right-hand man. I happened to be short of money on that day, so I went to a cheap but respectable hotel to get lodging for the night. I met the lady who ran the house and asked her if I could get a good room. She said that all the rooms were taken, and then asked me if I would not sleep in a room with Judge Wright. I asked her what kind of a man he was, and she replied that he was a fine gentleman. I then told her that I would sleep in the room with him. After engaging the room, I left the hotel and joined the sheriff in the search for Turner, the train robber. About twelve o'clock that night, I returned to my room and went straight to bed. There was no one in the room, and I soon fell asleep, for I was considerably fagged out. I had been asleep about half an hour when a man entered the room and woke me up with his racket. I turned over and watched his movements for a while in silence. He lit a lamp and when I got a glimpse of his face, I decided that he didn't look much like a lawyer to me. He staggered across the room and sat down on the side of his bed. Then he pulled out his revolver and, half cocking it, threw it over against the wall. When he got through, I asked him what his name was. He did not tell his name, but replied that he was the deputy sheriff from Tongue River. I told him that he was making an awful play with his six-shooter, and that even if he was the deputy sheriff from Tongue River, he had better go a little slower. I remarked that there were women and children in the next room, and that they would be safer if he kept his six-shooter still. He then attempted to enter into conversation with me, but I told him I was too sleepy to talk any more. I went back to sleep after he had turned the light low, but nearly an hour after that I was again rudely aroused by another man coming noisily into the room. This time it was the lawyer who had been recommended to me as a fine gentleman. His face was red, and, like the deputy sheriff, he also threw his feet high when he walked. Getting his clothes off seemed rather a difficult task to him, and I thought he would never accomplish it. When he finally did get undressed, however, he had an equally hard job getting in his bed. He and the deputy sheriff slept in the same bed, and I was frequently disturbed during the night by them getting up to get a drink of water. About five o'clock in the morning, the lawyer made one of his regular dives at his bed, but this time he went the wrong way and landed on top of me. I jumped up, and, grabbing him by the collar, I led him to his bed and pitched him head first on top of the deputy sheriff. Then I dressed and went to a $3 hotel and paid a dollar for a bed until breakfast. End of chapters 28 through 31.